Welcome once again to the People of the Free Gift podcast, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach out to those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. Hey there, welcome back to People of the Free Gift podcast. My name is Jason Oaks, and in this podcast we go deep into God's Word, and we have been going through the Gospels for quite some time now, and now we come to Matthew chapter 20. And it's also covered in Mark chapter 10. And we're going to have a very awkward request that is asked of Jesus in the name of James and John. Ever have that happen to you? Somebody requests something in your name and you would ne- you would kill them if you knew that they were doing it. And it, to make it worse, they're standing right there. So it's a little bit vague as to whether they wanted um, their mom to speak up in their behalf and make this request to Jesus, or if they were just kind of sheepishly there in the background, kind of cowering as uh, she was asking it. So let's go ahead and jump right in. And if um, before we do, just want to remind you, as I always do, If you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel. If you love going deep into God's Word, if you love diving into apologetics topics, then this is the channel for you. And so go ahead and click that subscribe button and give a thumbs up on this video to let me know you like this content. And now let's go ahead and jump right in. Matthew 20, 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's children with James and John came to him, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So here we go. We got the setup and you have James and John. They're there and their mom is there. Now, you may not uh, remember. It's hard to keep the apostles straight. So who were James and John? They are the sons of Zebedee. These are one of two of the original apostles that were called out of the fishing business. Zebedee was a prominent businessman in his community. Uh, He had a prominent fishing business. James and John were a part of it, and they left everything to follow Jesus. And so now we're, you know, into the third year, and um, now the mother of James and John, she comes around, she's probably checking up on her children and seeing that, you know, Jesus has somewhat of a following, but he's also, she's probably heard a lot of bad things about Jesus, um, a lot of plots against Jesus, and she's concerned for her boys. And she's thinking in her mind that, okay, well, it, if they're going to go ahead and do this, and if they're sacrificing all of this, they left the family business, they left the the guaranteed, you know, riches, they were set up. Um, If they left all of that to follow this guy, and they were two of the first, then this is not unreasonable uh, for me to request that they be given some priority in this whole kingdom thing that Jesus seems to be preaching. So the mother of Zebedee's children comes. Now, also, you may not remember who James and John are. You know, these these aren't like namby-pamby mama's boys. Uh, these are the, these two were called the sons of thunder. You may remember there were some people that were speaking out, and they approached Jesus and say, hey, you mind if we call down some lightning from heaven and zap those guys because they're getting annoying? Okay, so they were nicknamed the Th- Sons of Thunder, and these they came from a fishing background. So these aren't scrawny guys; these are kind of muscular guys. I mean, they may have lost a little bit of their tone because they haven't been fishing for a while. They've been following Jesus, but they've been walking and traveling everywhere. So these are guys that are not, you know, your typical like, hey, quiet, shy, hide in the background, let mommy speak for us type of people. So that leads me to think that this mom was speaking on behalf of her boys because she was concerned for her boys, for their safety. She wanted to, she was concerned for their future and their security. And so she's going to make this request on their behalf. And I have a feeling that they were not too thrilled about it, but at the same time, kind of curious and standing in the background wondering what Jesus is going to say. So I asked you before, have you ever had somebody who has spoken on your behalf? 
And in that culture, you're speaking in the name of that individual. If you come representing that individual, you are speaking on their behalf. So it's interesting to me that, you know, Matthew presents it as, you know, the mother is speaking and Mark presents it as if James and John were speaking. And so it's very clear when you put those together that it was the mom that was speaking, but, you know, Mark basically said, puts it on James and John and says, hey, it, if your mom is speaking on your behalf, it's just as you just as well might be speaking. And this is important to keep in mind when we bear the name Christian which means little Christ. That's what it actually means. And that's, it was a term that was given to them by outsiders, by unbelievers in the church of Antioch first. And that's in the book of Acts. You can find that. And so we bear the name of Christ. We're little Christ. Okay. And that being the case, we're supposed to represent Jesus in every single thing that we do. And so everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that's a part of our life or not a part of our life, part of our character, not a part of our character, it's representing Jesus. And sometimes we don't do that very well. Sometimes people blame their unbelief on the hypocrisy of Christians. And so, you know, you can't take this too far and say that it's legitimate to not believe in Jesus and take his claim seriously because somebody who follows him did something. That's not legitimate. But at the same time, we should be aware that everything that we do represents Jesus. And in the same way, on a smaller scale, everything that we do represents, you know, the, the company we work for, that the family we're a part of, you know, maybe f friends we're associated with, um, you know, hobbies, clubs, things that we're associated with. And so we need to be more conscious of that, not be so guided and predetermined based off of what other people uh, might think of us. And taking it too far and not being yourself. But we need to be conscious that the things that we do, do represent Jesus. Do represent our family. Do represent a lot of things that we're a part of. And we need to be conscious of that. This mom was not. Okay, She might have been thinking with good intentions. She might have been thinking in the best interest of her children. But ultimately, it's going to have backfiring ramifications for them. Okay, so Matthew 20, 20, saying, this is what she says, Master, we want you to do for us whatever we desire. <laughs> now, that not that like a setup? I, I have, you know, a five-year-old at home. You, you guys all know Jude, okay? And that five-year-old, he sometimes, he'll ask us a question and he'll ask us the question and say, say yes. <laughs> and, or sometimes he'll even say, um, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. You have to say yes. And, or you can only say yes. And then he'll ask the question. And um, that, that just so reminded me of this, um, or this reminded me of that, that they come to Jesus on those kind of terms. Hey, we want you to do whatever we want. So we're going to ask you, we're about to ask you something, but before we do, we got to get make sure that you're going to say yes. Can we get a promise from you that whatever we ask of you, you'll say yes. This is like the reverse of like in the Old Testament or sometimes in the New Testament when there's a ruler and they say, what do you want? Up to half my kingdom, right? And uh, so they come in the reverse and say, hey, we want you to do whatever we want. Now, do, let me ask you this. Do you approach God on those terms? Do you approach your prayer life with God on those terms? Uh, do you approach your you know, religious life with him on those terms? Well, you know, I'll do this as long as you do this. Um, I'll ask you this, but I want to make sure that y you're going to say yes. I I'll... You know, I'll do this for you as long as you're going to do this for me. And that's really a conditional thing. We asked last week, you know, is your God free? Is he, or do you put him in a box? 
And this is kind of like the vending machine Santa Claus kind of God. This is some Christian groups really, I believe, put God in this category. And in fact, they they read scripture as a list of promises that God has declared by which he has bound himself, that it is it is his obligation that if you say it right and you believe it, then it will be yours. They call it name it, claim it theology. Um, some have said blab it and grab it theology. And that's really the type of that's the type of request that they are telling you. This kind of request is what they would say is like a model of what we should follow when we approach God. That we should look at look for his promises and then match that up with something in our life that we want and we desire and we say it. And we don't say anything negative against it or uh, doubtful against it, but we keep on proclaiming it and we keep thanking God in advance for it and we keep believing it and it will be so because God is bound to do that. And that's not true. That's not the way that this works. This was not a healthy way to approach Jesus. And it wasn't then, it isn't now. So going on to verse 21, and he said unto her, what do you want? She said, grant that my two sons may sit, the one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom and your glory. And so, so here's the request. And like I said, there's nothing in saying that she had evil intentions. There's no reason to believe that she had evil intentions. She is a mom this is what moms do. They're concerned about the well-being of their children, and especially when their children are in danger or their, ch their children are making sacrifices. Um, they want to make sure that those sacrifices are going to be worth it, that their, their future is going to be set up, that they're going to be safe, they're going to be secure. That's what moms do. That's the way that they think. And so this mom is no exception to the rule. She is... is very much so looking out for the best interests and the well-being of her children. And so she comes and she makes this request. And notice Jesus' response, you know, do for me whatever I want. And he says, well, what do you want? And then she comes out with requests. Now, th this request is really extravagant. You think about, okay, Jesus is proclaiming himself to be God and ruler over everything. He has a kingdom that's going to rule over everything. And uh, so now he he's talking about this kingdom and she comes up and says, hey, my two boys, one on your right, one on your left. What do you say, Jesus? Can you promise me that? Can you promise me that? And I, I'm wondering if she was going so far as to say, basically, if you can't promise my boys that, they need to leave. They need to come back home. They need to be on the right and the left hand of their father, Zebedee, and the fishing business. And by the way, did I mention that it's been hurting since they left Jesus? Do, do you feel like maybe you can compensate the family for their losses? <laughs> because James and John left to follow you, and it doesn't. this doesn't seem to be panning out for them to do anything for them financially or success-wise, career-wise. So... Um, can you do something for me and my family? Can you promise me that they'll be on your left hand or right hand? Now, obviously, this is the seats of authority and power and prominence. You know, Joseph and Daniel, you know, occupied these types of positions in the Old Testament in Egypt and Babylon and Persia, respectively. And so that's what she's asking. You know, Jesus, when you come in your kingdom, would you grant that my two boys would sit on your right and your left hand, the two greatest seats of prominence? And this good intentions don't always turn out so well. You can't say that the end justifies the means. And you can't say, well, I had good intentions. And, you know, good intentions are often the seed 
of really, really bad things, destructive things, um, harmful things happening in the lives of people. And so you could say this mom has good intentions, but sometimes we have to check and ask ourselves, why am I really doing this? And what am I really asking for? Is this really the right thing to do? Or is, is it, should I wait? Should I not say this? Should I, should I take some other course of action? Is there another way of doing this? Okay, those are always <clears throat> good questions to ask before we actually step out and forward on our plans. And this mom really, really, really should have done that in this case. So verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink up and to be baptized with the, baptize, the baptism that I'm baptized with? So here's the interesting thing. This is where Jesus puts responsibility for the mom's request on James and John. And they, they're standing there. They're standing here. They're with her. They're not saying, hey, mom, be quiet. Okay. You don't know what you're, they're not coming up with these things, which tells me to a certain extent, they were maybe embarrassed by what she was saying. They were either embarrassed or they were in on it, or at the very least, they were embarrassed, but curious about what Jesus was going to say, because they would they're probably thinking, well, it's out there, so we might as well see what Jesus has to say. I mean, hey, that wouldn't be too bad sitting on the right and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. That would be pretty cool. So let's just kind of sit back and let's see what he says instead of correcting their mom and saying, no, you're grossly misunderstanding what's going on here, and that's really inappropriate. There's There needs to be a boundary conversations here, mom. You know, why don't you go back home with dad? Does dad know you're out here doing this? I mean, come on. So Jesus turns to James and John and he says, hey, do you guys really understand what she's asking on your behalf? Do you, do you guys, are you able to be, to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Now, who knows if they even understood what he was saying here. Now, we can look at the text and the Gospels as a whole, and we can understand that what he is saying is, are, are, you, are you able to do what I'm about to do? Are you able to go and die on a Roman cross and going a little bit further, you know, like you're asking basically to be equal with me, you know, uh, to sit on the right hand. I mean, this is the same phrase that's used of Jesus in relation to God, right? I mean, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And it, he is equal in, in that language. And so, you know, James and John, they, they're... They're putting in a request to be seen as equals, basically, in authority. And Jesus is saying, well, if you're going to be my equal, are you also going to die for the sins of humanity on the cross? Are, have you lived a perfect life? Are you a satisfactory sacrifice to appease the wrath of God and to atone for the sins of the world? Are you able to do this? And, you know, aren't you glad <laughs> that you don't always get what you ask for? This is one of those things that I'm glad that God doesn't operate off of the name it and claim it prosperity gospel type of mentality. Because there's a lot of things that seem really good from our point of view. Well, if I only had this, God, could you just provide me this? And we're thinking just a little bit more. Just a little bit more power, a little bit more money, a little bit more fame, a little bit more success, a little bit more popularity, a little bit more this and that and the other. Okay, And 
Jesus, you know, God's saying, you know what, I know what's best for you. I see the end from the beginning. I have the plans that I've made for you. There's certain specific good works that I, um, I have designed for you. You have a relational world around you of people that I've specifically placed there because they don't know Jesus and you do. I know what I'm doing and I'm going to have to say no on this one. And the scripture says in Romans 8 that the, the Holy Spirit even intercedes for us in our weaknesses. That basically what he does is he takes our words and our prayers and our requests and then he reinterprets them and sends them to God in a way that reflects, perfectly reflects his will. And so in a way you could say that God always answers our prayers in the affirmative, in the yes. But it's with a little help from our friends, from, from the Holy Spirit, okay? And so aren't you glad that you don't always get what you ask for? And that's true on a human level, you know, kids asking their parents for things, sometimes it's not in their best interest and the parent says no. Sometimes the same thing is true in a relationship with God, that we think that there's something that's really cool. If I was just be able to have that, do that, be there, know that person. And God says, no, that's not in your plan. And so I'm going to have to say no or not yet. Verse 22, they said unto him, we are able. <laughs> And Jesus, I feel like he was really just like he talks with the unbelievers. And I think he's trying to get them at that point to say, no, we're not. I'm not able. I'm not able. I'm not worthy. And that was completely inappropriate, Mom. Please forgive us, Jesus. Mom, go back home <laughs> or come follow Jesus and learn a little bit more about what we've been doing these last three years. We are able. Wow. Wow. And you see the picture on the screen. You can do anything, but not everything. And you think that, that seems like a paradox, an oxymoron, but it's true. You know, your parents want you to grow up believing you can do anything that you want to do. But the truth of the matter is the things that you're going to want to do are probably going to be in line with the things that you're passionate about, the things that you're gifted in, the thing that you know a little bit of something about, or at least that you're willing to put the work in to learn something about. So the truth of the matter is, like everyone starts out with a blank slate and everything, all the options in the world in front of you. But we narrow those things down naturally because we're going to gravitate towards the things that we're strong in. You don't typically gravitate toward the, the subject that the, you're the worst in or the, the thing that you really don't, you, you have to struggle to find the motivation to do or um, the thing that you, you really are, are bad at. Okay, we, we don't gravitate towards those things. And so it, it's best to know your limitations, know what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are. And surround, you know, lean into your strengths, surround yourself with people who can complement your weaknesses and shore those up. And so that together you can work towards the whole. Know your limitations. And at this point, their limitation was that they are a sinner. Yes, they're following Jesus. Yes, they've sacrificed a lot. Yes, they gave up the family fortune and business and all that kind of stuff. But they're still sinners, they're still in need of a savior, the very thing that Jesus is going to do. They're not his equals. They're not his peers. They're not on the same ground. They, they shouldn't be asking to sit on his right hand and their left hand and on, on his left hand. That's just not something that any human can ask to do. Okay? So uh, we are able. No, you're not. No, you are not. So here, interesting, note this response by Jesus. Verse 23. And he said unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptiz baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. 
but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of by my father. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> this is a twist. They, you know, Jesus at first asked them, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I am? Are you able to drink of the cup that I am? And they say, we are. He, they should have said, we aren't. No way. Not even close. So they said, we are. And so Jesus is going to approach them the same way that he approaches unbelievers now. He's trying to get them to tap out. They won't tap out. They're, they're struggling with their pride. And this is where it comes out that there's a little bit of them, at least, that really believes that they're qualified and that they're able to sit at his right and left hand. So maybe they worry on it. And so Jesus says, well, guess what? You will. You will go to that cross. And if it's not a cross, you will die a martyr's death. Now, the interesting thing is that one of these two is John, okay? John the Beloved. John, G John the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he didn't actually die. He actually, you know, they couldn't kill him. <laughs> okay, but they would give up. They would sacrifice. They John, even John, he was exiled. He 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 did put up with persecution and living into an uh, an old age. He spent most of his life in an underground church as a leader and apostle in a movement in which he could get killed or persecuted or thrown in jail at any moment. And so, in James, uh, I believe was the first uh, one of the first who actually died. Okay, so um, Jesus is saying, like, hey. There will be a tough road ahead of you. You guys will lay your lives down on the line for this. Okay? But I actually can't grant the request. I'm not the right person to ask. You need to take that up with my father. And Jesus didn't even know. You know, this is another one of those things. Uh, well, he doesn't specifically say that, but it seems to be implied that hey, that's my father's decision, and I'm going to submit to his decision, whoever he feels best to sit in my right and my left when I come to the kingdom. That's his call. And to, the truth of the matter is, I don't think there's anybody who's going to be sitting on his right and on his left. I think that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and however that's going to work, and what, however that's going to be visualized in heaven, um, you know, one God, three persons, and Jesus seems to be the only physical manifestation of God. And so um, my hunch is that we're going to see Jesus on the throne, and it's going to be symbolic of the whole Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, that's it, you know? Like, we're going to rule and reign with him, but no one's going to be his equal. No one's going to sit. You know, Jesus does say, like, I will grant, he who overcomes, I'll grant sit on my throne just as I've overcome and sat on my father's throne. And I think that's that's crazy to think like that Jesus one day is going to let us take turns, you know, those who have overcome and, you know, rule and reign with him. Like the idea that he's going to sit up, stand up one day and say, hey, why don't you sit here for a while, for a day, for, you know, that, that is crazy. Okay. But it doesn't instill in me a feeling that like of pride and boasting and like, oh, this is my destiny. Like, I don't in any way, shape, or form feel like I'm worthy or, you know, in that moment, like, okay, I'm going to obey because you're my master. You're out, you're saying I can do this, but I'm going to feel completely out of place, I would imagine. I mean, there's going to be no sin in me at that point, so maybe I won't. I don't know. I don't know. But that's like, that's hard to even imagine and to think that that's what these guys were asking. You know, at least their mom was, you know, like, hey you know, one on your right, one on the left. Let what do you say, Jesus? You know, that that's just crazy. That's just crazy to think about. Verse 24, and when the 10 heard it, they were moved with indignation and were displeased with James and John. Well, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. You know, basically what these guys, what their mom has done has 
completely alienated them from the other 12. You know, because it, the way that she has presented it is like, hey, they were one of the first and they gave up more than these other guys. And so they deserve it. They deserve the place of prominence. And the others are probably looking and going, dude, we've given up just as much. We've been here the whole time, too. We've been with Jesus in the embarrassing moments, in the scary moments, and in, in the faith-building moments. You know, we've done miracles but through the power of the Holy Spirit, just like you. Uh, we've been here listening to Jesus' teaching. We've, we've, <laughs> Dude, seriously, seriously, you're, you would be okay with, what if Jesus said yes? What, what what would you guys have done? Like, you you would just take the place of prominence, and then the rest of us, the uh, the ten who gave up the exact same thing. Like, what what we're we're not going to be in those places of prominence now. Like, you know, like you're our our superior now. Really, like you're equal with Jesus, but then we're not. And like, what what I I could tell that I could see like this would create chaos and you know jesus would probably be the most frustrated because now there's dissension within the group and this whole conversation that got left in the dust a little bit a while back you know hey who's the greatest when we come in the kingdom jesus you know smacking his head smacking their head you know like you guys seriously you're gonna bring this back into the forefront you know we just got over this Remember the whole thing I, I talked about serving and that's where he's going to go, right? So awkward moment between them and Jesus, between them and the other apostles. I, I can't imagine what it would have been like for those days and weeks following this. This threw a huge wrench in the whole thing. Verse 25, but Jesus called into him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be servant of all. So Jesus goes, goes right back to what he had said to them before, that Greatness in my kingdom. If that's what you seek, then don't seek it in the way that, that everyone else seeks it. Don't seek it through promotions and titles and power and rank that you can lord over people. Don't look for a place of prominence in which you're going to sit and ask for people to serve you. If you want to be great, then play the role of the servant. Play the role of the least. When we come into a room, you grab the water and the towel. And you wash our feet. You serve our meals. You go last. You take the, the seat of least importance. You let others go first. You put others above yourself. And then you'll be great. Verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus throws himself right out there as the example and says, be like me. The way that you've seen me, who am I, guys? Who am I? Well, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. That's right. I came down from heaven. I was sent by my father down from heaven. You've seen my power. You've seen, you've heard my claims. You know who I am, guys. But do I sit around barking orders at you guys and telling you what to do and asking you to do things for me? 
or do you see me right out there on the front lines serving and healing and teaching? Sacrifice, love. That's what I came to do, guys. That's what I came to do. I came to become one of you. To die in a, a most humiliating way. To be born even in a most humiliating way. To be one of you. And to die for you. To die in your place. And he says, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. And when we talk about the cross and what Jesus accomplished for us when he hung there on that cross, there's a lot of different ways in which it's put. But one of those ways is that he says, I was giving my life as a ransom. And a lot of people in recent years have taken an offense to this, this particular view of the atonement and what Jesus was doing because the implication... If there's a ransom, then that means there's somebody who is held captive in bondage and there's a price on their head. Guess who that is? That's you and that's me. That's everyone who's ever lived. Being a ransom means that somebody is making the payment and guess who that is? That is, that is Jesus. But being a, ran being a ransom means that you're making the payment to somebody. And who would he be making to? And this isn't God. Jesus isn't making the payment to God. Who is the one who has taken us captive? And that's the thing that really offends people about this. But the truth of the matter is that this talk of redemption and ransom and the, those who have been taken captive, that we are freed from our bondage to sin, to the devil, to do his will. And I don't know how literally you can take this, but Jesus used this idea of a ransom as a metaphor to tell us that we have been freed from our bondage, that he has paid our price. As the Apostle Paul says, that you are not your own, you have been bought with a price, and so glorify God with your body. And that is the truth, that we have been purchased. The payment has already been made, paid in full. The payment for your debt has already been made in full. The question is, are you willing to receive it? Are you willing to receive it? Jesus laid down his life as a ransom for us all. Are we willing to receive it in what he has done? I just want to encourage you, if you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and share this video with others and this channel with others. It helps every time you do that. It actually helps the channel out financially, and it helps us to grow and get in front of others. Um, if you want to connect with us, we invite you to join the conversation, facebook.com slash people of the free gift. And until next time, this is Jason from People of the Free Gift, signing off.